Hi everybody and welcome back to Practice Makes Faithful. Today we are in the season finale of season one. We've done this for a full season. We are in the 21st episode and we're excited. So it's going to yeah. be a good day. Um, I'm Ben Patterson. I'm joined by Paul Hubert. Yeah, it's good to be here for what is uh, us Memorial Day Monday, actually. Yes. So we're knocking this out early and uh, and then getting on with, with the day. you have any fun plans for the day, Ben? Uh, I'm going to go and buy a grill. Today. Nice. That's, uh, that's my big plan. As I want to do some grilling, and my grill was old and rusty, so I threw it away. There you go. And now I need to go get a new grill. So I think it is. There is some sort some of grill Memorial hunt. Day like foul if you don't grill there is, Memorial there Day. Is, yeah, so I'm, I'm yeah. glad you won't be, uh, you have no Memorial Day referee coming into your neighborhood. And exactly. Yeah. Tea and you I already feel like I'm a little late for the first grilling of the season. <laughs> so, but you know, today's a good day to get started. be excused if you didn't have a grill. That's, yeah. 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 So that's good. How about you, Paul? What you doing? Uh, we are actually taking off uh, as soon as we're finished with this for, for a couple of days of camping. Okay. Awesome. So I'm I'm not the biggest camper in the world, yeah. but uh, but Lori and the kids really enjoy it, and so uh, so we're going to be doing that, heading up into the mountains for cool. a few days, cool. and uh, we'll just see what happens. The weather looks like it's going to be fantastic, so that yeah. that's a really nice awesome. thing. So if you're going to camp, you better have good weather. But there's nothing worse <laughs> than being in a tent in the middle of the night, it pouring rain, and you're in there soaking wet, and then you all yeah. end up trying to sleep in your vehicle. Not uh, uh, this sounds yeah. like this happened. Well, yes. I mean, not not with, <laughs> not with the family, but you know, when I, when I worked yeah, in youth yeah. ministry on several occasions, yeah, you know, let's go oh. camping with the youth group, and then we all end up sleeping in cars because, yeah, yeah, <laughs> been there, done that on that one, yeah, mm, mm, yeah. yeah. Hey, yeah. well, we I'm digress. sure it's going to yeah. be a great time. Got good weather. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. But today in the podcast, we're going to be in Under Pressure, the final part of this series, part five. Yeah. This is about our series on First Thessalonians. So, um, Paul, as we dive into that, why don't you just give us a quick recap. What is this series? What is Under Pressure all about? Okay, fast uh, series recap. I think maybe just hitting on some, uh, some high points. Um, the Apostle Paul was writing this letter to, uh, to this church in Thessalonica. Um, to really celebrate the fact that they were living faithfully under pressure. He mm -hmm. sent his uh, you know, young apprentice, Timothy, to go spend some time with the church in Thessalonica. Paul was unable to be there himself, so I think he'd sent him from Athens to go uh, check in on uh, the Christians in Thessalonica. Timothy comes back with this glowing report. Paul was afraid that because the Thessalonican Christians, the Thessalonian Christians, were facing so much pressure mm -hmm. that they would cave to that pressure and abandon their, their very young faith in Jesus. But what Timothy found was uh, a thriving community of disciples who were committed to Jesus, who were growing in their faith, who were probably growing numerically as well. And so uh, Paul just is moved to write this letter of, of rejoicing, of uh, further encouragement to them uh, to say, okay, you're gonna keep facing pressure. So since you're facing pressure, continue to live like this, do more of some of these certain things. You know, we, we talked about that in one of the messages, you know, more faith, more hope, more love, D dig deeper into these things, more sanctification, all this stuff, live deeper into holiness. Um, you know, so it's just a letter really written to encourage and celebrate the faithfulness of a group of Christ followers who are under pressure, living the life that Jesus had called them to live. And so, Made, made the point in, in the first message that the Thessalonian Christians then, because of the way they lived as they faced pressure, have a lot to teach us about how we should live as we face mm -hmm, increasing mm -hmm. pressures in our current culture, in our current day and age. And you know, I'm not the only one looking around saying that, man, it's, it's becoming more difficult to live your faith uh, in an out loud way. What we know is that our, our culture here in North America is becoming rapidly more post-Christian, which mm -hmm. means, you know, we used to have kind of a Christian-y culture, um, you know, Christianized culture anyway, for sure, where the values of, um, you know, you could call those, uh, you could call that the Judeo-Christian ethic, mm -hmm. worldview, some call that, that was kind of the norm. And it's moved to a place where it's no longer the norm. And so when we say we're gonna live out our Christian values, we're gonna live our faith in Jesus in, in a loud and visible way, which is what we're called to do as Christ followers, Jesus says, you know, don't be a light that's underneath a basket that is hidden so that no one can see it. Uh, that kind of light is no good. He says, no, in fact, what we're called to be is like a city on a hill. 
It's there for everybody to see. You know, we're supposed to let our light, our light shine in front of others so that they would see our good deeds. And some will be critical of us. Others will give glory to God for those. And so that's the call when we're under pressure to live that kind of way. They were doing that in Thessalonica. And so we have a lot to learn from them uh, as we face increasing pressures, as it's more difficult to live the Christian life and get a pat on the back for that. Yeah. You know, yeah. instead of being you know, patted on the back or, or being complimented even at work or, uh, you know, being the person who everybody looks at as trustworthy, you may now actually find yourself in a place where people, um, people question whether or not they can trust you because of your faith in Christ. Or being the person that uh, before everyone thought was very moral, moral and ethical and upright, um, now people may look at you and say, no, your position is actually the unethical position. Um, on a particular issue because of your Christian faith, you know, especially as it relates to sexual ethics and other things like that. And we've talked about that in the series. So again, there's a lot for us to learn in, in this particular letter as we ask the question, how do we as Christ followers who are finding ourselves under pressure from culture around us, how do we continue to live in a way that expresses our faith faithfully uh, day by day. So, so that's kind of mm -hmm. the, just the recap of the series. I can just move in and briefly talk about what this last message was about. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so tell us about that. What did you talk about this week? So um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, the Apostle Paul really has this focus now. To He shifts his focus from talking about uh, what they're doing and how they're doing it to kind of the why and has them really look out in the future mm -hmm. in a sense. And so he talks about, you know, the return of Christ or the day of the Lord, as he calls it. And, and in a sense, what he does is he's, he's saying, listen, the, the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. So since that's true, this is what I want you to do. I, I, want you to, I want you to keep living the way you're doing. I want you to lean further into faith, hope, and love. I mean, all these things that we've been talking about, you keep going further into that. Why? Because you know how this ends. Mm -hmm. You know how it ends for you. You know how it ends for those who are not embracing faithfulness to God, who are continue to, continuing to embrace paganism or do whatever they want to do or practice yeah. idolatry in their lives. And so you know that. So what you need to do is live your life. And that's really where we landed this, this message. Uh, and we can come back and talk about that more. But you need to live your life with the end in mind, which is, mm -hmm. I, I think, in a sense, based off this principle that we uh, you know, organizationally know leads us to success. If we start with the end in mind, if we're planning for a big event. Um, we don't just jump in and start talking about, uh, you know, the event per se. We ask ourselves the question first, what would this look like if, if this event went just the way we wanted it to? Yeah. Or, you know, the, a message series. What would the message series look like if, if everything went just the way we hoped it would? You know, or as, and we pray about that and we ask God too, God, what is the end that you have in mind? And so when we get a good picture of that end, then it helps us navigate the journey along mm -hmm. the way. And mm -hmm. so, um, so that, that's really what Paul is encouraging these Christians in Thessalonica to do, you know, to live in a sense every day as if Jesus might return. Yeah. And even so, if Jesus doesn't return today, tomorrow, the next day, if you live with the end in mind, that's mm -hmm. going to change. It's going to change so much about how you mm -hmm. live. So let's talk a little bit more about that, of this idea of starting with the end in mind, of like, why is that important? Like, why do you see that as being a helpful thing, either in, I mean, I guess you could understand that really in two spheres, both in just the, yeah. in a leadership <clears throat> perspective, but then, I mean, I think it would very similarly apply in our faith. Yeah, so, so let's just think about, I mean, we can use this principle, we can talk about it both at the leadership level and then kind of at the individual personal level as well. Um, you know, we, we've been in meetings, Ben, where we've, we've been sitting there and we're, we're having to wrestle with something we've done for years, but we're not actually sure why we do it that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, why do we do it like that? You know, I've said several times, if, if, um, if the best answer we have for why we do something is, well, we've always done it that way, then we need to actually stop doing what we're doing or figure out the why all over mm -hmm, again, mm -hmm. because it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, you know. And so, if we don't know why we're doing what we're doing, then then we're kind of operating aimlessly. Yeah. You know, the same I think is true in life. Yeah. Uh, you know, if 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 you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, and, and I see that with 
with a lot of folks, um, you know, nowadays, I think, you know, we've gone through a period of, of real disillusionment uh, as, as just human beings in the last several years, whether it be because of the COVID pandemic, whether it be because of the great loss of jobs for a while. Now it, it looks like a lot of jobs are coming back, but, you know, then we now have inflation that we're dealing with and everything costs more and, mm -hmm. and life isn't quite what it seems like it once was, you know, where we were living truly kind of life in cruise control. And, you know, I, we could expect that every day was going to be pretty good and there would be some hard things that would come along the way. And we know that's true. It seems like we just faced a series of really difficult things in a row, unrest politically, unrest socially, mm -hmm. all these mm -hmm. different things happening. And we've talked about, you know, John Verveke and his uh, you know, studies and conclusion that we are in the midst of a meaning and purpose crisis societally, especially among the younger generations. You know, I think a lot of us have forgotten why we do what we do, or a lot of us don't have a why. We don't have a purpose. So we don't have a, a target out there that we're aiming for. And so it makes all of the movement of life sort of aimless and beyond aimless. It can also lead you to a point where if you don't have a target and you don't have a purpose, you might actually get to the place where you go way beyond aimless to hopeless. What's the reason for any of this? Mm -hmm. There is no purpose mm -hmm. for it. There is no reason for it. I'm hopeless, you know, because I've got nothing to shoot for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've seen that with organizations, when organizations and churches in particular seem aimless. Um, we're just going to keep doing the things we're doing because we believe that that's what church is about, you know. So um, living out the mission of Jesus uh, is, is not first and foremost in the mind of a collected group of people or individual disciples as well, because we know that the mission of Jesus, as we live that out, I mean, Jesus says that I, I brought glory to the Father, he says. I brought glory to you, God, by doing the things that you sent me to do. Mm -hmm. So we bring glory to the Father by loving him well, by doing the things that he sent us to do as well. But a lot of people, you know, I think for, for a time, even as churches, we just kind of believed if we showed up on Sunday morning or of individual Christians, if we showed up to what we call church on Sunday morning, we were doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, that was it. So there was really an, an aimlessness as, as Christ followers even. Um, and again, organizationally, you know, we, we know what it looks like when, when businesses, organizations, nonprofits lose their focus. And, and there, there's, uh, there are a lot of studies done about the life cycles of organizations that organizations start with a lot of focus and purpose. And if after a time they don't continue to redefine that target out there or uh, continue casting the vision for that target out there, they'll lose hold of that purpose and that focus and that vision. And that because of that, um, they will move into this stage of stagnation and then oftentimes collapse. Yeah. You know, so I think that's just true. It's, it's a principle that's true across the board. So, you know, the Apostle Paul knew as, as a good leader does, I've got to keep this big target, the big why out in front of you mm -hmm. because you need to live every day as if Jesus might return. You need to live with the end in mind and it will change everything about the way you live if you do. So I think, I think that's maybe for me, that's a, an explanation of, um, that's good. of why. Yeah, that's really helpful. So it seems like in this passage, the end that kind of Paul is putting before them is this idea of the day of the Lord. Uh -huh. And that is an idea that... I, I don't know, like that's a term that a lot of us may not be super familiar with. Right. Like, what is that? What does that What does that mean? What is Paul talking about here? Yeah, so the day of the Lord is, um, is a phrase that is used in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it's, it's often meant to communicate kind of a, a time where God visits. And as the presence of God visits, it's, I mean, it's a scary thing to be in the presence of God, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, you can look at Isaiah 6 when Isaiah is in the presence of God. He has this moment where he realizes, you know, as he's in the presence of perfect holiness, you know, absolute perfection, he has this moment where he cries out, woe to me, for I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips and I come from a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the Lord. So I'm, I'm toast, I'm, I'm in trouble. Yeah. You know, and so Isaiah was in the presence of God. The presence of God exposed his unrighteousness. And really, that's what the presence of God does. It, it exposes either righteousness or unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's, that's God. 
Mm -hmm. You know, so when you're in the presence of perfect holiness, your unholiness, your unrighteousness is, is entirely exposed. And so when we think about God visiting or the presence of God coming in a specific way, and so the day of the Lord is in the Old Testament is not always necessarily about the moment when Jesus returns, but in the New Testament, uh, the second coming of Christ is what is typically, uh, what the authors typically have in mind. But again, so we're gonna have the, the presence of Christ coming and now it's going to be the Christ who has been glorified, sitting at the right hand of God, who is now, and Jesus, again, as, as he walked on earth, was, was, of course, always perfectly holy. But there was this, almost maybe the buffer of his humanity somehow, <laughs> that uh, was something that, uh, you know, served maybe to protect those who walked with him from that the unbridled holiness of God somehow. I, I don't know how all that works. It's super hard for us to get our mind around that. But when Jesus comes, and that's why even we see that in, in Revelation, when he comes, I mean, he's now described as both the lion and the lamb. We see him as one who has like a sword coming out of his mouth. I mean, he's, he's now frightening, but also fully loving too. And so we've got these hard things to hold in balance as it relates to the reality of God. Well, I think the day of the Lord, we have a difficulty because it is, it is a visitation of God himself. Now, this day of the Lord that we're talking about in 1 Thessalonians 5, again, is the coming, the, the return of Jesus as the absolute rightful king of everything. And so in that moment, we're holding in balance too that, that God is coming, and as he visits us, it will be both a day of incredible hope for those who are found righteous through the blood of Christ, but a day of judgment for those who are not within that, that same protective envelope of the blood of Christ. You know, we know that we're not righteous of ourselves. I mean, we, we live to try to be holy as God is holy. But the only path to righteousness is actually through the blood of Christ, right? So mm -hmm. we're redeemed through the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. But we know that there are also those who reject that. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of the day of the Lord is, is both a day of incredible hope, but a day of mourning and judgment for those who are not following Jesus. And I think we, we have a hard time holding those truths in tension you know, it's just like this idea that how can God be a God of love if God is also a God of wrath? I think that's a hard question for us to deal with. And many have said that actually God's love and God, God's wrath are two sides of the same coin, which I think is true. So if there is a God who is all loving and God sees evil happening in the world, and especially kind of this, this horizontal expression of evil, right, where mm -hmm. we are awful and evil to each other. Yeah, I mean, if we just, very, very sensitive, heartbreaking subject, but, you know, if we could just wrestle with this question for a minute, how, how did God react to what happened in Uvalde, Texas last week? I mean, how did God react as a young man? Uh, we don't understand his motives fully, but, but there, was, there was evil working in his life that moved him to the place where he would walk into an elementary school and take the lives of 20-ish people. Yeah. How does God react in that moment? I mean, his heart is absolutely broken for what happened, but the evil that would cause that kind of thing to happen, if God is not angry about that, then how is God really love? In fact, it's God's love that moves him to be angry mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that kind of evil. Mm -hmm. Now, I know it's more difficult when we're talking about the concept of uh, judgment and an eternal judgment, mm -hmm. that's more difficult. But again, if I could come back to this idea of holiness, of the, the absolute holiness of God, and I think that's sometimes what we miss. You know, so yes, it's in the nature of God to be loving, but His nature means that He is also perfectly holy, and that those then who have not been justified are being sanctified cannot be in the presence of God's holiness. Yeah. So then there is a removal from the presence of God's holiness, and that is something that will eventually be something that lasts eternally. But again, if, if we understand the nature of God well, then his, his, that day of hope and judgment both make a lot more sense and his, both his fully loving uh, nature and his wrathful nature also make a lot more sense.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so we're talking about. I guess I just want to make sure, make sure I'm fully tracking on this. So we're saying the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, the time that God shows up for uh, setting setting things right per right. se. It's a day of hope and judgment. But like, what what is what is actually happening in on the day of the Lord? Yeah. Well, if we if we take a again, if we take a kind of total picture of the view of what the New Testament says is that, you know, Jesus will return. Mm -hmm. And when he returns, he will judge um, in a sense, you know, there's going to be a a separation of, you know, Jesus himself says the sheep and the goats, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the the sheep being the faithful, the goats being the unfaithful. And so it is, it is this moment of the, again, the the second coming, the, the actual return of Jesus when at least life as we know it ceases to be uh, ongoing, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's the end of life as we know it, but it is also the beginning, I think, in the of life as it was meant to be, for those again who are are found uh, to be those sheep, to be faithful in Christ. And so, Paul is saying, look, I, I want you to live your life with this in mind. This is this is eternity. So you know, we talk about life being a vapor. You know, life being a vapor, it's, it's here for a second and gone the next. So if this life is just a vapor, in a sense, the warm-up act for what's to come, you know, not that this life doesn't matter, it absolutely does matter. We see that very plainly. But in, in comparison to eternity, which is coming, where, um, where Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, he says, the immortal will clothe itself in, in immortality, or in a sense, the tent of this body will be replaced with something eternal, like an eternal dwelling, mm-hmm. you know? So it, it is that moment where as Jesus comes back, we shift from this temporal existence to an eternal existence. And those of us who are, are um, found in Christ, clothed with Christ, it will be an eternal life that we then transition to. Um, and then, you know, we could get off on wild tangents talking about what what does an eternal death look like? Mm-hmm. Um, but but that is what is on the other side, you know. So yeah. again, it's it's hope and judgment. So eternal life, eternal death. Uh, you know, life forever with God, life forever separated from God for that yeah. on, from that okay. time on out. Again, this idea of holiness features in a very paramount way in this discussion. Mm-hmm. The, the only way we can be in the presence of the holiness of God is to be found righteous and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. So we're clothed in Christ. If you're separated from that, you cannot be in the presence of holiness. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important to note that, that even Jesus clarifies um, <clears throat> this place we would call hell uh, was created for Satan and his angels. It is where, when separation happens, it is where people who don't follow Jesus spend eternity, whatever that means. Again, <clears throat> we could have an entire episode mm-hmm. debating yeah, that yeah. concept, <laughs> and we're not going to do that uh, today, but but it's, it, you know, we do need to see that there's, mm-hmm. there's this, yes, you can be in the presence of holiness moment because of the blood and the covering of Christ, because of being clothed in Christ, and then there's this, no, you can't be in the presence of holiness, and so that means eternal separation from God. Uh, as well, and so I think you know that that's what's happening on the day of the Lord, as Paul is talking about in First okay. Thessalonians five. That's helpful. So now, now let's kind of connect that idea back with our with that first question I asked you about starting with the end in mind. Is that this is this is something that Paul wanted us to have in mind? He thought yeah. this day of the Lord, the idea of the day of the Lord, was something important for us to have in mind in order to live faithfully to Jesus. Like help just connect those dots a little bit more. Then we'll talk a little bit about how we actually do that. But first, just yeah. help connect those dots between those two ideas of why did Paul think this is so important for us to have the day of the Lord in mind? Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, if, if, if there is no God, and this is borrowing from, uh, from a very biblical idea, if there is no God, we should just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So let's, let's just live it up. Let's do whatever we want to do. Let's satisfy ourselves. Let's please ourselves. Let's, you know, let, let's chase after our own desires, regardless of the, the hurt and, and, you know, and, and suffering we may cause to other people along the way. Let's, let's look out for number one, right? I mean, that, that's, I think that's 
um, that is that would be the goal in life. You know, if you know, again, we're, we're in the midst of a, a meaning crisis. I think because a lot of people have found that that's actually that's not fulfilling in any way. But that is certainly what uh, what our postmodern culture tells us to go chase after and pursue. Yeah. Right. So define. You know, make your own meaning. Uh, ma- you know, define your own truth. And, and then, you know, nothing matters more in life than your own personal happiness. Mm-hmm. So chase mm-hmm. after that happiness, regardless of what that means for your relationship with others. And, and we find that as we destroy relationship with others, pursuing our own happiness, we're actually killing our own happiness as well. We're not, we were made to be, exist in harmony with each other as, as human beings. So um, Paul kind of addresses that in this passage when he says, look, there are some who are basically saying, you know, so like, while people are saying peace and safety, what he's saying while people are saying, look, don't worry about this day where, uh, where God will visit us. Don't worry about this day of the Lord idea. Or, or don't worry about any sort of judgment that could exist upon the way we live our lives. Basically, live as if there is no creator and like you're the ultimate authority. I mean, that's what is behind this peace and safety idea. Mm-hmm. It's everything is just fine. <laughs> Do, do what you want to do. Don't, don't live your life um, with a larger goal in mind than just having fun, than enjoying yourself. That, that's kind of what is behind this peace and safety idea that, that he brings out. You know, so he says, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them. You know, so again, he's, he's urging to, you know, that this day is going to come like a thief. Live every day as if Jesus might return. You know, but this idea of everything is going to be just fine. I, I talked uh, during the message, and you know, it's, it's always been super comical to me. We lived uh, 10 years in the state of Florida before moving here. I, I actually spent some time growing up in Florida as well. And I can remember, um, you know, many people preparing for hurricanes because that's, that's part of like a seasonal reality <laughs> in Florida. You're always watching the tropics. You're watching the, you know, the Atlantic and then the Gulf to see what's going to happen. Uh, because at any point in time, one of these massive storms could come barreling your way. My, yeah. my parents live in Panama City, Florida. Um, and uh, was it, it'll be more than three, maybe four years ago now, I think, when Hurricane Michael came ashore there with somewhere between 155 and 160 mile per hour winds hmm. and just absolutely decimated that area. My dad and I went down. They came up here to um, kind of escape the storm. Uh, and, and so... Uh, we went down the day after, and, and I'm, I'm telling you, Ben, it looked like a bomb had gone off. It was incredible, the destruction and damage uh, that, that, um, that hurricane brought on shore. So I'm always amazed when, uh, you know, you always have, uh, uh, you know, these weather guys on the Weather Channel. I think uh, Jim Cantori is, is one of those guys, one of his, I think that's his name. Uh, you have these guys who will camp out. You know, and they're standing in, uh, they're standing as the hurricane is starting to come on shore. You know, they're leaning into the wind and it's, you know, they look like they're about to blow away. But then they'll always have these interviews too with these people who rented out a hotel somewhere, like right on the beach, uh, to throw a hurricane party as the storm was barreling in. And, and there's the potential of incredible destruction, but they're standing there, you know, partying while the destruction is about to come upon them. Mm-hmm. And it's like, this is, the, this is what life is all about. We're partying in, you know, we're going to do it in the face of this terrible thing that could happen almost as like looking in the face of, you know, staring disaster in the, in the face and, and laughing in the face of impending impossible disaster. Um, but, but that's kind of how hmm. some people live their lives that's a good analogy. as well, yeah. you know. And yeah. so, um, hmm. you know, if we're saying peace like and that. safety, don't worry, everything's going to be just fine. But here we have this very clear indication that everything is not going to be just mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a day coming, and yes, it's a day of hope, but it's also a day of judgment. Um, it changes then the way we live. Mm-hmm. We're not the people who are just saying peace and safety anymore. We're not the people who, you know, who are, have our heads, I think, buried in the sand anymore. So um, Paul, then, Paul then moves to talking about the contrast between those of us who are living with the end in mind and and others who are maybe, you know, living out the hurricane party kind of lifestyle, right? Uh, and he says, you know, it's, it's kind of like the difference between light and darkness, or it's the contrast between night and day, or it's the difference between being awake and being asleep. I didn't say this in the message. Um, maybe I shouldn't say it here either, 
but it's it's been a thought that's been pinballing <laughs> in my head uh, for the last couple of weeks as, as I've been putting this together. But in a sense, what Paul is arguing is that Christians are the original woke crowd. I mean, seriously, mm-hmm. like we're the original woke crowd. We, we in a sense, you know, I mean, he, he says also it's a difference between being sober and drunk. But, but what he's saying is that we're the ones who clearly see the reality of the world around us. We're awake to it. Mm-hmm. We know the real spiritual reality. We're not asleep, but we're awake to that. Mm-hmm. So we see what's happening and, and it brings us to a, a place of action. I mean, it changes the way we live in relation to those who are asleep, who don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's why we're on mission, trying to wake people up to the truth of God. You know, and we do that through love. You know, yeah. we're not really shaking people, although maybe sometimes that is, I don't know, <laughs> a tactic, I suppose. But, but we're trying to do that by loving them well, by sharing with them what we know, by representing the truth of God well. So it, mm-hmm. it changes everything. Um, when we are at a place where we, uh, where we know what's coming, what's ahead. Again, yeah. uh, you know, we clearly see the world around us. So you kind of already started transitioning into that a little bit, but let's, let's get a little bit practical with that. Of what does okay. that, what's that look like to live in that way, to live with the end in mind? And you talked a little bit about living with, uh, in the way that we are loving people, in the way yes. that we're, the example that we're setting. But um, what, el- what else might you add to that of, what does that look like? Yeah, so, so Paul again returns to this idea of, uh, of faith and of love and of hope. I mean, he's, he's been hammering on these three. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and certainly 1 Corinthians 13, he does the same thing. Faith, you know, he talks about faith, hope, and love there as well. I mean, these are, these are central ideas to what mm-hmm. it means to be a Christ follower. You know, faithful faith, uh, hope, we know what's coming, love expressed for others, um, love that, that guards us in a way too. I, you know, that, that I think if we return to the fact that, that this is about learning how to live under pressure, how to live out our faith under pressure, um, in a very practical level, Paul actually says to the Thessalonian Christians in this section of text, uh, he says, listen, what you need to do, you need to guard your heart with faith and love. And that, that's a very important thing. When we think about living under pressure, um, Again, remember his concern for the Christians in Thessalonica and why he sent Timothy was because he was afraid they were going to cave to that pressure, that they wouldn't be able to stand up against that pressure. And so as he is concluding this letter to them, he says, listen, you need to wear faith and love like a breastplate, like a piece of armor to guard your heart against what is coming at you. So faith and love, because it's easy to lose hope. I mean, it's easy to get to the point where we could become truly calloused as, as attacks come at us, where we could, um, where we could get to the point where we become, we become discouraged as we walk. And so we have to make this effort to, to let faith and love, um, I think, become such a part of us that it actually acts as this armor to insulate us from whatever attacks may come. And then he says the same about hope. He says, you know, you need to guard your mind uh, with the hope of Christ. As we think, um, we we talked about this before, but this current phenomenon, and they they put the label of deconstruction, and then even further, truly walking away from faith is deconversion. So again, Mm -hmm. we define deconstruction as kind of like the bit by bit pulling apart elements of the faith that you hold dear. Um, Sometimes a certain amount of deconstruction can be healthy in the sense that, especially if we're deconstructing uh, an unhealthy church experience we mm-hmm. grew up in yeah. with the, the sense of reconstructing then a healthy faith, or maybe the end game is reconstructing a healthy faith in Christ, that, that can be a, a good thing. But there are times where the attacks are coming uh, fast and steady and are actually aimed at uh, moving us to deconstruct our faith in Christ. And so when we're talking about deconstructing faith in Christ, that's not a good thing. Yeah. Right? So there's, a, there's a, a, a difference and there's a big debate about whether, we, whether deconstruction is something we should say is uh, it, it, you know, kind of showing a positive light at all. And I think maybe we should find a different word for it. But the reality is when we, many of us have walked through uh, church experiences that were unhealthy. Mm-hmm. So whatever we need to do to disassemble and disentangle ourselves at times from that unhealthy church expression so that we can lean into a truly healthy church expression, we ought to do that. But I think we can all agree that deconstruction as it relates to, um, 
to the pulling apart elements of the, that are central to the faith, that's something we don't want anybody to have to walk through, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but, but the attacks right now that are coming uh, are aimed at, at the mind, at the intellect, also at the emotions. And so for Paul to say, uh, guard your heart and guard your mind, guard your heart, again, so the breastplate of, um, that, that is made up of faith and love, then this helmet that we put on that is made up of you know, the hope in Christ, so we're guarding our minds with the hope of Christ, uh, th these things are meant to protect us and guard us from these places where we find ourselves under pressure. So Paul is saying, listen, as you find yourself under pressure, how do you live with the end in mind? Well, you actually work on guarding yourself so that that hope can continue to be real to you. Now, I know that's kind of philosophical. So, um, you know, how do we take and make that practical? Because you're asking mm -hmm. for some, some practical mm -hmm. pieces. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, think, um, I think one, there is this, I think we need to do a good, evalu a good evaluation and ask ourselves, you know, what does my life really look like? Am I living with the end in mind in the sense that my life has a definite purpose and focus to it? Or am I living aimlessly? You know, am I living like one who is awake or am I living like one who is asleep? Am I living like one who is sober or am I living like one who is drunk in a sense and, and you know if you've I talked about kind of my first moment uh, seeing somebody who was drunk at, at a young age and just watching this person and thinking what what is going on you know with this person and that was you know real drunkenness brought upon by mm -hmm. you know, brought, brought about by alcohol consumption but Paul is saying metaphorically we can live our lives like we're just staggering around <laughs> and and we can't keep at all in focus this end that's out there yeah. somewhere we're just staggering around so I think it's good for for us to sit down and, and do this from time to time now you know it, you read books and stories about the most successful people in life and we're talking about probably worldly success in this sense um, but the most successful people in life uh, many of them have have this commonality that they sat down at some point in time and they actually wrote mission and vision statements for their life. And then they filter their decisions through those mission and vision statements for their lives. Again, they began with the end in mind. I think uh, it, it would be good for all of us. And um, you know, I, I did this a few years ago. I sat down and I wrote for myself a mission statement for my life and how I wanted to serve and lead others to be disciples who made disciples and how I wanted to spend my life in that. Mm -hmm. That I would say yes to the things that God asked me into and that I would, I would look very critically to say no to the things that God wasn't asking me into. And certainly if it surrounded this idea of, of helping foster cultures both here at Grace Chapel and other places as well, that um, if it would help to foster a culture, a disciple making culture, uh, so, so we could see this reality happen here on North American soil that's happening in other places um, so that we could see it come to fruition that, that our culture within the church would be one who made disciples who made disciples, that that was the culture and reality of our church, that I was going to look to say yes to that, even if it meant you know, that, that I was going to be worn out, tired, whatever, because that's the goal. For me, that's the goal. That's the end. You know, I think for, for all of us as Christ followers, it's good for us to sit down and have one, the ultimate goal in mind, which mm -hmm. is eternity mm -hmm. with God mm -hmm. forever with Him. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Unbelievable to even think about that that is offered to us. But then as well, what role do I play within that? And so while it may se seem strange to sit down and craft a mission or vision statement or both mission and vision statements for your life, um, that is the kind of focus that we as Christ followers ought to be living with. Uh, that's the only thing that'll help us live every day, I think, as if Jesus might return today. And then beyond that, that's good. Uh, to that's help good. us to really live like we know we're, where we're going, period. Mm, that's good. So as we close, our final question, and you may have, <clears throat> may have already hit on that, but is, uh, is how do we practice this to be faithful to Jesus? Yeah. That's one practice you'd encourage us to do this week. Yeah, so, so one practice, I mean, you know, maybe this is a, again, it's, it's just a self-reflection first. Yeah. 
yeah. self-reflection. You know, what, what does my life look That's like? If, if somebody were to look at my life um, and examine my life from the outside, would they see a person who is living with a purpose that is mm -hmm. centered on mm -hmm. the mission of Jesus Christ and, and the ultimate return of Jesus as the forever king? Would they see that about my life? Mm -hmm. Would that be evident about my life or would they see something different? So what would be the ultimate purpose of my life uh, if I were to ask three or four people? And you might, each, you might even do something like that. Hey, if you were to look at my life, uh, find a few friends you trust. If you were to look at my life, what would you say, um, what would you say my purpose in living is? Hmm. That's a scary thing to do. Yeah. There's no yeah. doubt about it. Um, you know, it's, it's scary like, like sitting down across the, the table uh, from someone and asking the question, you know, what, what is it like to be on the other side of me? Which, you know, uh, our friend Jeff Henderson has, mm -hmm. has uh, encouraged people to do. Um, and and that's, that's a frightening thing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I think it's, it's just as frightening to say, tell me what you see about my purpose in living life. What do you see mm -hmm. as I'm walking daily? Um, and then if, if it is confirmed that maybe you're living for something else, your, your prime reason for living is not the mission of Jesus and is not the eventual return of Christ as the forever king, then it's maybe good to sit down and say, okay, what steps do I need to change that, that need to take to change that? And again, maybe writing uh, both mission and vision statements, even some goals and objectives. We do that for other things. Why in the world would we not do that for something as precious as the one life we're given to live? Mm -hmm. Right. We sit and we sit down and do that. You know, if you're listening, watching, you, you probably if you own a business, you do that in your business. Yeah. yeah. But this may not be your only business. You may have five more businesses before, uh, you know, your your eventual time comes. Um, but you've only got one life. Mm. Mm -hmm. So why not take your life as seriously as you take other ventures within life and sit down and say, it's time for me to get serious about what the mission is and then the vision for how I live that out and keep the end in mind daily. So I think, that, I think that would be my challenge. That's great. Awesome. Well, thank you, Paul. It's a great spot to close it. Great way to close this, uh, this series of Under Pressure and then really this season of Practice Makes Faithful. Yeah. This has been really good. I think we've both really enjoyed these conversations over these last few months. Yeah, enjoyed the feedback from folks, and, and you know, yeah. certainly we hope that you'll, you'll keep that coming. We love mm -hmm, the comments mm -hmm. and other things like that. We, uh, you know, we've even said if, if there were questions, we'd love to come back. And so maybe even in, as we move into season two, mm -hmm. maybe we'll lean uh, even, even some more into that. But uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's been rewarding for me. It's been rewarding to hear um, about the fact that, you know, especially for those uh, who are listening, who are connected here at Grace Chapel, yeah. how this yeah. through the week helps take what we've talked about on a Sunday and it makes it real from Monday through Saturday as well. Yeah. And so, so that we're seeing people um, put into practice the things that they're learning. And, and we know, I mean, that's why we call the podcast Practice Makes Faithful. It's yeah. not Practice Makes Perfect, but it is practice, practice, putting into practice the things that we know to be true and real uh, the things that we're called to do makes us, takes us to the place where we're living things out faithfully. And so, yeah, I think that piece of it is probably the most rewarding to me yep. at the sitting at the end of this first season. Yep. I, I would wholeheartedly agree. And we will be back. We'll be back for season two. We're just, we're taking a little break for the summer. It's helpful for That's our right. schedules. We've got a lot of ministry stuff going on and trying to record each week would be a little challenging. So. Yeah. We'll yep. be taking a little ba a little break, but we will be back on Wednesday on our new day on August 10th. Unless the day of the Lord comes before then. That's true. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> Lord willing, the creek don't rise, as they used to say in uh, West Virginia. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll be here. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, but between that time, do be watching because we might be dropping a couple of special episodes. We got a few things in mind that we're going to do yeah. throughout the summer. So That's right. still stay tuned to your podcast feed. And also, we want to encourage you that Paul's book, The Way Back, is out. So we want to encourage you to go ahead and check that out. You can order that on Amazon That's right. or wherever you Barnes buy your Noble, books. You know, yeah, that kind of stuff. And uh, Ben was actually holding up the, the hard copy version of it, which is, yes. it's, you know, it's neat, kind of crazy to 
uh, holding holding my hand something like that that yeah. <laughs> uh, you know that 18 months of work went into um, you know I think as part of uh, some of the bonuses that we'll be dropping um, just finished recording the audiobook version mm-hmm. and so I got to do that read that myself uh, and that will be uh, within a month or so it will be available on audible and some other um, I think on the iBooks uh, audiobook uh, uh, version of iBooks as well um, but we'll be dropping the uh, the introduction and chapter one on the podcast feed is just a sample mm-hmm. of the audio uh, between here and, and August. In fact, in August, as we pick up, um, we will be working through this book chapter by chapter. So we'll be connecting that back in the podcast uh, for the month of August and September, leading to a time of uh, repentance before mm-hmm. God as a church together, saying, God, we want awesome. your way and your will for us. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Awesome. Awesome. So there's a lot of great stuff to come here at Practice Made Faithful. Keep tuning in. Reach out. Let us know questions, comments you have. We always appreciate that. And until next time, uh, we'll see you all again. Yeah. God bless you and uh, see you in two months.